to our third and final speaker for this panel, um, Dr. Abigail Echo Hawk. She is an executive vice president at Seattle Indian Health Board and director of the Urban Indian Health Institute. Thank you so much. It's such an honor and privilege to be with such an incredible group of people. Um, I do apologize. I'm experiencing some internet issues today. I promise to keep talking. So um, today I decided after talking with my co-panelists that they were gonna be presenting some incredible data. So I'm just gonna share some comments with you so that we can also make sure that we have time for questions at the end. Um, I greet you from the lands of the Coast Salish people where I live as an invited guest as a member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma on Coast Salish lands. And I want to acknowledge that many of you most likely do not live as invited guests in the homes, in the workplaces, and in the spaces in which you live and work in the United States. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about the experiences of American Indian and Alaska Native people. I'm specifically gonna use American Indian and Alaska Native, and I'll tell you why here in a few minutes. Um, rather than indigenous, as we go through and talk, I do identify as an indigenous person. I am a mother, I am a daughter, I am a granddaughter, I am a uh, community member, and I am the executive vice president of a federally qualified health center in Seattle, Washington, that serves American Indian and Alaska Native people and all who step in our doors the Native way. In addition to that, I direct the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is one of 12 tribal epidemiology centers located across the country. My goal and my mandate um, as a tribal epidemiology center and public health authority is to look at the 71% of all native people who do not live on tribal lands, but rather in large urban settings across the United States. And I'll be sharing their experiences in addition to those of our tribal people. So in the data that was just presented, I'm, I'm a data nerd, you know, researchers call me a researcher from Western perspective. My community calls me a storyteller. So I wanna start with a story. We um, as native people have been storytellers for many generations. And this is one of the ways we pass down knowledge and is part of our, of our scientific methodologies. I wanna tell you the story of a young woman who at the age of 18 found herself pregnant in a large city, had never been outside of the Indian healthcare system before and accessed a large hospital in a large urban area. When she went to her very first prenatal visit, when the medical assistant came in, and began to go over her you know, little chart she'd filled out. As soon as she stopped, she said, oh, you're Native American. And then she began to question this woman about how much she had been drinking. She would not believe her when she said she had not been drinking. And in fact, that medical assistant soon pushed up that woman's sleeves on her arms when she thought she was getting a blood pressure, but instead turned her arms over to check to see whether or not she had been injecting drugs. As a result of that very discriminatory visit, that outwardly racist visit in a making assumptions of what this woman ha had been doing as a result of her race and ethnicity. This young woman did not receive prenatal, prenatal care again until she was in her sec well into her second trimester. Unfortunately, when we look at the initiation of prenatal um, for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and specifically in urban areas across the United States where folks are always telling me, but there's such good access to services. There's really good access to services if you are a white person who's birthing. People of color, American Indian, Alaska Natives, other folks do not receive that same quality of care. And as a result of that, when my team took a look at the initiation of prenatal care of American Indian, Alaska Native people who birth in the United States, we found that 28% of those who were birthing people initiated their care in the second trimester. Now we all know that that increases risk of both infant and maternal death. Why is it that it is taking our people such a struggle for them to get the resources that they need? So as I frame my comments today, it's not going to be talking about, um, and I think Dr. Perry just framed this beautifully. I'm not gonna be talking about the people accessing services. I'm going to be talking about us as a system of medical care providers, as public health professionals, as systems that have been structured in such a way that they inhibit the ability of American Indians and Alaska Natives to receive the care that they should, and also inhibit our ability to be properly referenced within the data. My colleagues showed incredible data. In some of that, you may have noticed that rates on American Indians and Alaska Natives were not reported. And um, I was looking at some of the slides, I zoomed in real close, and they, I was looking at the suppression policies, which are very important. 
um, where they don't report on data if there's less than 10 deaths, for example, to ensure that you're protecting privacy of the family is very important to do. Why is our population so small and why are we so often left out of the data? We are a small population of people here in the United States as a direct result of the genocidal practices of the United States government, as a direct result of wanting our land and our resources and the killing of our people in order to achieve that. So I call on all of those who are working in epidemiology, who are working in biostatistics and doing research on people who birth is that you have to take a look at why and how your data is presented and why does it not reflect the experiences of American Indian folks? And I have to retrain them when they come into my organization on how to do small populations data analyses, doing things like aggregating of multiple years in order to come up with a large enough sample size in order to report the outcomes. Very often when I work with states and counties, they simply don't do that work because it takes extra time is very often the excuse. Recognize that as an excuse. Why is a small population, think about us as a small population as a result, direct result of genocide, we should be prioritized for the time and the resources to calculate the data correctly in order to truly understand what is happening to our population so that we aren't complicit in the ongoing attempted erasure and genocide of indigenous peoples. And I know those are very harsh words and I often get a lot of criticism, criticized for saying genocide so often, but it's something that, you know, I am descended from a population of people who in the early 1800s were estimated at 38,000. And in the census of 1910, there was less than 600 of tribal members left. I am a tangible manifestation of my ancestors' resiliency, but I'm often not represented in the data that is shown around both all data, but when we look at infant and maternal morbidity and mortality, we are very often let, left out of the data. And the data that is presented is also a gross underreporting. When we look at the rampant mis racial misclassification of American Indians and Alaska Natives in data, what we find on average is in between 20 to 40% of racial misclassification and vital statistics which directly inhibits our ability to understand what is happening with the population. And it's not an overestimate. We're, that's a complete underestimate as a result of the racial misclassification. Back to my story of that young woman. What we find is that some of our people actually will, if they can, pass for white because they know they will receive better services if they are identified as a white person, even though that's not who they are because of the institutional racism and structural racism embedded in our system from the way the data is collected to the way the medical assistants, the physicians, the providers, the front desk posts, the way that our systems are structured inhibit their care. So some of our folks are intentionally not recognizing themselves in your data systems as American Indian Alaska Native because they're too afraid of you. And that's not a problem of them. That's a problem of us in this field. And how do we shift our systems to ensure that we are properly treating our people with the dignity that they deserve? Because right now, that dignity doesn't exist. But it isn't something that isn't unachievable. And in fact, you can go to my website, uihi.org, and find out very specific ways to improve the racial classification of American Indians and Alaska Natives, the way the data should be collected, analyzed and disseminated, which includes respecting the tribal entities from which the data comes. For those of you who are unaware of the Indian Health Services, it is the medical care provider for about a third of American Indians, Alaska Natives living in the United States. It is a direct result of treaty rights of the treaties that we signed, many under duress, for the land that you all stand on right now today. It was payment and it was meant to be quality health care. Unfortunately, the Indian Health Service continues to be chronically underfunded, and in fact, generally operates at about 38% of funding for the overall need. As a direct result of that, we do not get the resources and services that we need, and it directly impacts the entire life stages of every one of our individuals who birth and their ability to access the resources they need from the medical systems. However, for the social determinants of health, we know there are many other systems that our people can't access. We have to begin to address the systems of inequity that are inhibiting not only our abilities to birth healthy, 
babies, but to live through those births. I'm gonna share with you one more story. My team and I had put out some data related to maternal mortality in the urban areas where there are Indian Health Service um, organizations across the United States. What we found in these urban areas at a national level that American Indian and Alaska Native women were, were 4.2 times more likely to die than non-Hispanic whites as a result of pregnancy-related complications. 4.2 times more likely to die. I will tell you that data wouldn't have come out of any other organization than a little tiny nonprofit with a core funding of $400,000 in the Indian Health Service a year to serve 71% of the population of American Indians and Alaska Natives in this country. The CDC had put out some recent data and I had noticed at that time that they hadn't included American Indians and Alaska Natives. So I responded on Twitter, love Twitter, follow me, Echo Hawk D3, um, and put our data out there. And as a result of that, I was contacted by a reporter who um, let me know she was working on a story related to maternal mortality and she hadn't heard about native mor um, maternal mortality. And so we began to work on a story together and I connected her with several pregnant women who were um, either having their sec second or third births who uh, were experiencing a large number of social determinants of health from transportation, housing, um, poverty, et cetera. And um, she was about to come to Seattle, Washington to interview myself and one of the women when I received a call from my team. And it was a pretty panicked call. As soon as I answered, they said, we have to tell you something about Stephanie. And I knew immediately at that point in time that either her babies had died or Stephanie had died. And I can share her name because this is a story that you can find on NBC News, a small documentary. Her name was Stephanie Snook. In the course of the two months of working with that reporter, not only did we have one of our mothers die, but we had two of our babies die. This is not an uncommon experience. It is way too normal. For me in the last 12 months of my immediate folks I know, and I do not know all native people, I've had the death of three babies and one mother. This is a experience that is directly impacted by things such as when my team in 2019 tried to publish a paper that had to go through at that time CDC clearance and I'm not, this isn't just about the CDC, this is about other institutions and other um, ways that we publish our research. When I submitted that, my team submitted it to the CDC to go through the clearance process that you have to do for all peer-reviewed papers, where we were looking at chronic disease conditions and talking about the experiences of Native women specifically, specifically those who had experienced sterilization as a result of Indian healthcare policies. The CDC um, would not publish the Government Office of Accountability Report sentence in there that talked about Native women's sterilization, and they said in the review comments that we had to take it out because it was inflammatory. So when we look at the medical systems and even the way that we do research, we attempt to publish research. There was a recent review that found of the top four medical journals in the world that less than 1% uh, of those articles, peer reviewed articles actually said the word racism. And out of that less than 1% that said racism, most of those 90% were opinion pieces, not empirical research. We have a structural racism issue within our field that we have to address because it's directly inhibiting our ability to provide the proper care and address the social determinants of health. Until we address inwardly the research and science field and the research enterprise, we will not make the changes we are attempting to do because I will publish every single inflammatory paper I possibly can if it saves one more woman like Stephanie Snook. Thank you. Really, really um, tremendous work and tremendous storytelling. Um, thank you. Um, your, your people, your community uh, will be proud.